So welcome to a special edition of our Ask a Light Open Educational Practices Special Interest Group to mark Open Access 2022, Open Access Week 2022. And this year, the theme is open for climate justice. Um, amid the doom and gloom, this week makes an argument to our communities around the world that changing the world for the better is possible and that open access uh, and the open movement, open scholarship can play a key role in that. Um, before we open the session proper, I want to acknowledge that this event is taking place on different Indigenous lands. I'm personally coming to you from Wurundjeri land where I work and live from various places here. And the artwork on this slide um, is by the Wurundjeri artist, Judy Nicholson and depicts the wedge-tailed eagle Bunjil, who's the creator deity and ancestral being of many First Nations people of Victoria in Australia. Uh, looking to the present day, it's been really tragic to see so many Australian waterways flooded so badly from Shepparton to Lismore to Maribyrnong, um, waterways that have been under Indigenous custodianship for thousands of years. And, you know, it's these themes, these very relevant themes of climate change and climate justice that will rightly inform uh, many of the discussions of Open Access Week this year. So uh, I'm going to introduce our speaker now, um, uh, Ashley Barber. And I think Ash this year has really embodied what it means to be an active member of the community. And she's played a really pivotal role in keeping this group's um, momentum going and keeping things active and even brought in international speakers from her network to present to us. So that's been really fantastic. Um, she's a support librarian at the University of South Australia, where alongside teaching and research support, she passionately promotes and facilitates the integration of um, inclusive open educational resources into pedagogical practice. And excitingly, this year, Ash is the 2022 Libraries of the Australian Technology Network Fellow. Um, and she's used this fellowship to explore uh, practical inclusive solutions to OER uh, and she's also an active member of the Call OER Collective Community of Practice um, and this SIG for which she co-curates the monthly digest which you can see on our website and sign up for um, emails about and she's recently returned from North America to uh, bring us some insights from overseas regarding uh, inclusive, uh, a creation of inclusive OER. So please take it away, Ash. Thanks, Stephen. I'll just take over the screen share. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ash Barber. As Stephen said, I'm a librarian at UniSA and uh, one of the digest editors for the OPSIG. Um, and I would like to just take this moment to uh, respectfully acknowledge the Ghana people as the traditional, traditional custodians of the unceded lands where I live and work and I'm zooming in from today. Uh, and I extend that respect to all First Nations peoples and acknowledge their deep and spiritual relationship to country. One thing I'd like to mention at the top of this talk is that there will be times throughout where I'll use the term inclusive as an umbrella term for inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility. And I recognise that those are distinct concepts, they're not interchangeable. Uh, it's just for the sake of clarity that sometimes I use an umbrella term. So we're here for this chat because, as Stephen said, I've uh, received the Latin Fellowship this year. Um, and so the Libraries of the Australian Technology Network, it's a group of university libraries which collaborate to advance broader communal objectives, uh, one of which is the exploration of open educational resources. But why this project? Well, to tell you more about the fellowship I'm working on, I want to give you the brief context of why I propose to undertake this project in the first place. 
through my experience in the OEP SIG and as a librarian in higher education, I have observed and encouraged the flourishing of OER in Australia, not just adoption, but now creation too. Many Australian universities have very active open publishing houses now, and with the rollout of the call, the Council of Australian University Librarians Pressbooks Pilot, many more universities are taking that next step into OER creation too, finding and filling gaps in Australian curriculum resources. In tandem with this, the awareness of why OER is a good thing is certainly spreading, especially the issue of textbook cost to students and how OER can have the cumulative beneficial effect of lifting significant financial strain, increasing student retention and growing student success rates. These facts were discussed in Dr. Sarah Lambert and Habiba Fidel's national scoping study released earlier in the year. However, they primarily, uh, they primarily highlighted the as yet unrealized potential of OER to meet other social justice needs. And I really do encourage everyone to check out that study if you haven't already. It's in all seriousness, a page turner. <laughs> the other social justice needs in the classroom are issues related to a lack of inclusion, diversity, equity and accessibility, or IDEA for short, um, particularly in relation to who gets to publish, to author, to speak. When traditional textbook publishing routes systemically create barriers to marginalise some voices and mainstream others, OER reveals itself as a vehicle to bringing marginalised voices to the fore. So more than just saving students money, while valiant and important, OER can do so much more to empower people through not just access to readership, but access to authorship. So with this context in mind, OER as a burgeoning field in Australia and a nation scale push to, for supported OER creation. Many librarians like me are wondering how best to support the creation of OER that fulfills this potential for delivering more empowering educational experiences. And what's a typical first thought? Go to Google, talk to colleagues, reach out to authors already working in this field, look at the hotspots where this practice is more mature. As a result, you end up swimming in a sea of overwhelming information. So many frameworks and guidelines and protocols and papers and studies and everything in between. It becomes a cognitive overload in itself to figure out which resource to even dive into to begin learning how to undertake this task. Well, that's where my fellowship project comes in. I propose to visit my colleagues in the US and Canada and organizations which are further along in this process than we are having well-established OER and open pedagogy programs, teams, and crucially, resources. So, fellowship received. In September, I set off for California, where my host, James Glapper Grossclag at the College of the Canyons introduced me to his extensive network of open education colleagues across the state, so I could pick their brains about process, workflows, lessons learned, challenges, and key tips for us Aussies to glean. And you'll hear more about these tips later in the talk. After a week in sunny California, I flew to Vancouver in Canada to meet with the brilliant minds at BC campus, where Amanda Coolidge and Clint Lalonde connected me with their colleagues in several higher ed institutions throughout British Columbia to continue the brain picking. I was also very fortunate to spend a day with Carolee Klein to continue our months long conversation around the intersection of OER and universal design for learning, her area of expertise. The third and final leg of the trip returned me to the US this time in Minnesota, where my hosts, uh, Dave Ernst and Barb Thies, both uh, from the Open Education Network, the OEN, once again organized meetings with their incredible colleagues, including a meeting with Al Kazlikas, a senior as associate with the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. Al is working on a particularly exciting project in collaboration with the OEN to indigenize an environmental science textbook already in use in several courses across the US with plans to develop a model other countries can follow to undertake similar projects with local Indigenous peoples. So, after two and a half weeks of travel, engaging in 21 meetings with 46 people and garnering about 33,000 kilometres of frequent flyer points, I now have the largest spreadsheet the world has ever seen of tried and tested resources, methods and tips to put together a practical online resource for Australian librarians to get started with facilitating the creation of inclusive OER. So what is this practical resource and when do we get it, you might be thinking. 
Well, it is in production. It's a website and will be CC licensed, of course. And its purpose is to guide you through the considerations and practical steps to take for ensuring an OER does adhere to IDEA principles. It avoids the purely theoretical in preference for the practical, concrete steps you can take right now. And it will also include rabbit hole opportunities for those who do wish to wander deeper into different areas of IDEA. This particular project has a tight, uh, tight scope. So I envision this resource, this website, as an ever evolving piece born out of collaboration and grown through continual collaboration. So the initial iteration and deliverable for the fellowship will be published early next year. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the key insights so far that you'll see incorporated into the site. These are themes that really wove strong threads connecting all these highly successful places I visited during the trip. And I want to talk about some of the themes that were supporting the work as well as the actual resources. So number one is a dedicated OER role. This is the single most commonly promoted aspect of all organizations I visited. Even without me asking about the staff or team structure or whose role carries out which task, people were proactively telling me that pivotal to the longitudinal success of the open educational movement in their institution was having a dedicated role for it. This created a panoptic position for a coordinated approach to developing open resources suitable to their organization, to their context, someone who could see all of it and say across it. This role, such as an open education librarian or a team of staff with similar titles, becomes the point of contact, the single source of truth for academic, uh, academics authoring open texts. It creates legitimacy and solidifies the culture of OER in an organization as institutionally supported and here to stay, not just someone's passion project that ebbs and flows with the amount of time they have on the side of their regular work. This role is important to the inclusion aspect of OER because applying the principles of IDEA is relatively new to many authors and librarians alike. And so having a person whose job it is to be across this process, to guide others in this practice is fundamental to a successful inclusive OER production. And ideally the open ed team would include a role or a consultant whose focus is purely on this part. For example, BC campus has an equity, diversity and inclusion consultant um, who I spoke with while I was in Vancouver. Uh, her name is Chanel Tai. Her role involves working closely with the authors to consider things like the lens through which they write their book. What is their lived experience that is intrinsic to their point of view? And what does that necessarily exclude? So a dedicated OER role is not a resource in itself, <laughs> rather a strong theme throughout the trip that I just couldn't overlook. However, there are resources available to create this role, such as the CC Echo OER Specialist course. And that really long acronym <laughs> stands for the California Consortium for Equitable Change in Hispanic Serving Institutions, OER. This is a free online self-paced course on Canvas developed by the College of the Canyons that teaches the capabilities of an OER specialist. It takes you right through from the initial meeting with the author through the workflow of creating the OER with accessibility and some universal design for learning included, all the way through to publishing, licensing, distribution, and impact tracking of the final OER, the whole thing. Um, it also includes um, some resources for the hiring manager as well, it includes things like what to put in the position description and how to undertake the interview process as well. So number two, the branch ed equity rubric. One resource which was referred to by multiple people in every location I visited was the branch ed equity rubric for OER evaluation. It was developed to help instructors check with some level of confidence whether their curriculum materials are equitable. What's great about this particular resource is it was designed for versatility, such that it can be used to evaluate the overall level of equity in, for example, a book, or it can be used to assess just one aspect of equity, such as how culturally responsive that text is. The varying levels of depth of examination the rubric affords makes this a resource that accommodates such a wide variety of OER evaluation needs. You can use it to assess the thing you already have, or you can use it to understand the characteristics of a thing you're missing. Number three, the BC Campus Indigenization Guides. 
while in Canada, uh, several meetings surfaced the BC Campus Indigenization Guides. This is a suite of guides, each one targeted to different audiences and needs. For example, there's a guide for leaders and administrators, another guide for curriculum developers, another for instructors and teachers, and several others as well. The guides go through the what, why, and how to indigenize resources, courses, curricula, etc., uh, with the intention of embedding indigenous ways of knowing and being into the curriculum alongside the existing systems of knowledge. Naturally, these guides were developed for a Canadian audience. However, BC Campus very much encourages the adaptation of their guides for use in other regions, and they even provide advice for how to do this. Number four, the UDL guidelines. Anyone who attended the August OEP SIG webinar presented by our Canadian colleagues, Dr. Carolee Klein and Dr. Sarita Zhangjiani, will be familiar with the CAST UDL guidelines. These provide clear and concise suggestions for enriching course materials with universal design for learning principles, which are intimately tied to inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. The challenge frequently encountered with regard to UDL and IDEA is the notion that accessible means alt text or screen readable or subtitles. And these are all aspects of accessibility, but there's much more to it than that. For example, is the language full of idioms that disadvantage those who don't speak English as their first language? Can the page be downloaded as a PDF and a Word document and a plain text file? Is the information only presented in one format or is it offered as a video, as a text paragraph, as an infographic or a diagram visually showing connections between ideas? These are multiple means of access to a single piece of information. Thus, they form part of what it means for a resource to be accessible. Number five, the little wins. Again, I want to mention one of the threads that in itself is not a resource, but informs the creation of resources. When discussing the challenges of creating more inclusive OER, one of the interesting points that arose was sometimes you'd have an author who uh, was on board with the, the whole open thing, but was hesitant or protective of the work when it came to making changes to enhance the level of inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And I just thought that was really interesting to be won over by the socially just decision to make the work open, yet remain challenged by the idea of making it inclusive. And it became clear to me through these discussions that so much of this work is understanding people, what they care about, how they feel, and how to work within those parameters to gently but progressively expand their comfort zones as the concepts become more familiar. And really at the heart of this particular issue of open but not inclusive is the fact that nobody likes to be told they're doing something morally wrong. We naturally recoil at the thought and look for ways to justify ourselves. It takes time and practice to routinely pause and reflect on what we do and how it impacts upon others. And so Approaching this transition, this movement towards inclusive OER with similar methods to change management principles could gain more traction. Taking small steps, making one change at a time. And that leads me to another conversation I had in Minnesota, where the discussion turned to working with an author who is new to open and is happy to create open content for their students, but is reluctant to share that work beyond their classroom to make it truly open. And the advice given was to take the little wins where we can get them, to accept that small step that author has taken and to not push so hard too soon for entirely open that the response we evoke is entirely closed. Number six, Australian resources. Lastly, I did want to mention that, of course, Australian resources will be incorporated. For example, Nikki Anderson's freshly published press book, Enhancing Inclusion, Diversity, Equity and Accessibility in OER, because we have some great stuff too. So great, in fact, that BC Campus uses our resources right back. Um, they link to the UNESQ open text, opening eyes onto inclusion and diversity. So this is the beauty of open. We're all progressing in our own little pockets. So while one part of the world works on this bit, another part of the world works on that bit, and we can all just share with each other. This is the link and QR code to the website I'm creating. It's called Empowered OER, as I think that captures its purpose quite succinctly. 
At the moment, you'll just see a coming soon screen, <laughs> but you can save this link for when the site is launched. And I can even show you a little preview if you like um, during the Q&A. Um, so we're coming to the end of this chat now. And I know there's a ton of information here. There's a lot of work to be done, which can feel overwhelming at times. So I think it's important to regularly revisit our why, just to go all Simon Sinek on you. <laughs> that is, why are we doing this? What deep good is this work achieving? And well, I think this is it. We all know that information is power, that we live in an information economy where those who have access in all senses of the word to good quality information are the most empowered, become those with the most options and opportunities. At their core, inclusive open educational resources are simply information made accessible, a tool for empowerment. Inclusive OER is empowerment. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ash. Um, that was a really exciting talk and it's, it's so cool to hear lessons from the other side of the world that you've taken on board and shared with us. And I, I can also see some, some of those people from Canada and the US in this webinar to, today. So um, that's, that's fantastic to have this international theme, especially during Open Access Week. Um, oops, my camera. Hello. Um, so there was quite a lot in there from small steps to standards, guidelines and rubrics. Uh, how do we get from passion projects to institutionally led projects at scale? Empathy and understanding for where people are at. Do Does anyone here have questions for Ash? Feel free to either put them in the chat or also turn on your um webcam and, and feel free to just speak directly to us. Uh, yep, Tim. Um, hi Ash, um, that's been a great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I just wondering if you got any insights on your trip regarding um, uptake of OER textbooks by academics, um, where there was any like reluctance at all? Yeah, um, so as in adopting rather than creating? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think one thing to remember as well is we have quite a different higher education system here. So there are different motivators. Um, and so at some institutions over there, say, for example, a community college, they're focused on teaching and learning. They're focused on getting the, the um, they, they really care more about that social justice aspect as a first point. So there's, there appears to be less um, reluctance there. Whereas at one of the universities that's more research focused, um, there's a little bit more reluctance there because of course, um, tenure track involves a lot of publishing and focusing on that research aspect. So trying to get open educational resources into those courses can be harder. So yeah, they're definitely experiencing a lot of the same challenges just at different institutions. Okay, thank you. Hi Ash, it's Frank. How are you? Good, thanks. And great, Hi, great talk. Thank you. <laughs> um, I was particularly interested uh, around the um, your talk around uh, legitimising uh, OER librarians and, and making a specific team and a specific role for them, and also the fact that some uh, institutions have got consultants around uh, idea, which is fantastic. So I just in your experience, what what you went over for. Um, did you, can you explain some of the successes they've had by actually having a team of OER librarians and, and really focusing on um, idea as, a, as a, a tool to actually engage with academics? Have there been, were there any successes that you could see that you could share with us? 
Yeah, um, often having that idea consultant also meant that open pedagogy became more of a thing, which is where you get the students involved in the creation of classroom materials and creating the curriculum that suits, that is relevant to them. And so um, some places I went to had uh, really great examples of a textbook that was written by the students, you know, facilitated by the, um, by the course coordinator. Um, uh, but yeah, so open pedagogy became much more of a, um, a common thing when there was an open education team um, in existence there. That's great, thank you. I can see, oh, sorry, yeah, I was gonna say, I can see a message from Richard in the chat. Who are the key stakeholders and collaborators in the US and Canada when promoting or advocating for OER outside of libraries themselves? And what are their sources of funding? Okay, <laughs> that's like a double barrel question. So uh, the key stakeholders and collaborators when promoting and advocating for OER, um, definitely uh, approaching it from both the, the bottom and the top um, was a common theme. So having, uh, students advocating for OER, so from kind of like grassroots up, and then having the administration actually bring in policies, so meeting each other in the middle, that was a great way of creating cultural change in an institution. Um, but also the students in particular were great because they have a seat at many tables that the rest of us don't. So, you know, you've got student council, you've got the, the student body president who have a seat on um, different boards within the institution that the rest of us don't. So that was definitely one of the key themes that came through. Um, the other part of your question, the sources of funding. So that also varied. Um, it was often there was an institutional grant for um, authors to publish and they'd have different focuses on um, you know, different uh, criteria for who would get that grant, um, depending on what their focus was. Maybe they needed more information in one particular discipline, or maybe they wanted to focus on inclusion. Um, so those people would get grants. Um, but also some places had uh, government funded grants as well. And some institutions had really amazing grant writers who were just really good at getting consistent um, funding that way. But again, it's not a very stable um, source of income for it. But uh, yeah, so some places would get government funding uh, that I found in California in particular. Um, they do have it in their legislation there as well to, um, to help forward zero textbook cost um, Z degrees where there, there's no cost to the student to undertake a particular degree in relation to the textbooks. So there's legislation around that, which helps. Um, I can see some more messages from Adrian. Um, to what extent did you find institutions embedding inclusiveness at the point of creation for OER? Are authors mostly looking at these principles after authoring, that is applying principles retroactively? Yes, um, it is definitely much more common for it to be um, a retroactive approach rather than from the first point. Um, BC Campus is creating, um, I can't remember exactly what it's called. It's not quite published yet. It's some um, author guideline where it does um, encourage that discussion right at the start of the creation of the book, um, ensuring that uh, those principles are thought about to begin with. And they also um, think about that in terms of when they give out grants, are these going to are these grants going to projects that are going to encourage more inclusive practice? But yes, in, in general, it is much more retroactive. Uh, a way to subscribe to Empowered OER site. Yes, um, <laughs> once the coming soon is gone, uh, once it's arrived, you can definitely um, subscribe to get more, uh, to get notifi notified of changes. But until then, 
Not exactly. Uh, maybe if you want to subscribe to the OEP SIG um, website, um, I can post on there when there um, are updates on the site as um, the Empowered OER site as well. Um, that is always the best place to subscribe anyway. You get notified of everything happening in Australia. <laughs> so. One thing I'd like to mention as well is as um, this has been a resource created out of collaboration, if there are any suggestions from anybody as to other resources to include in the site, things that you think would be really useful for the Australian audience, please do feel free to get in touch with me. Um, you can see my details on the slide there. Um, you can email me, tweet me, um, whatever works. Um, I can see some things coming into the chat. Um, oh great, so um, Carolee, our, um, one of our colleagues in Canada, um, she said that funding can also come from grants of agencies such as the Hewlett Foundation and BC Campus, um, which is funded by the Provincial Ministry of Advanced Education. Um, in Canada. So the Hewlett Foundation publishes projects, I think worldwide, I know they do the US um, and they're funding the um, project I mentioned earlier about the indigenization of the environmental science textbook. The funding comes from them for that. Hmm. Are there any other questions or, oh yeah, something from Frank. Given that OER teams are usually located in libraries, how difficult or easy was it for the OER team to engage with academic staff, learning designers um, in the colleges? Do you think that these roles should be embedded within college teams perhaps? Yeah, well, in the US, um, I'm actually not sure how exactly where the position sits in Canada, but in the US, librarians are considered part of the faculty. Um, so they naturally have, um, a, a connection with the academics, um, which is really helpful because <laughs> they can, in some institutions, I don't know if it's all, but some there can be a bit of that us and them about faculty versus administration. Um, so having librarians already embedded in faculty helps. Um, there we go. So we've got um, a comment saying, not always librarians at UC California, they are not faculty. Yeah, so it must vary from institution to institution. Um, so, uh, the second part of your question, Frank, do you think that these roles should be embedded within college teams? I definitely think that there needs to be some kind of relationship between the, um, the teaching staff and the librarians or the, the whoever the OER people are. I mean, definitely librarians should be involved in this. Um, and uh, whether that's through a formal connection or just through relationship building, I guess that varies on the context. It's been quite interesting to compare differences and similarities between Canada and the US and Australian practice in this area. And uh, yeah, as mentioned, we do have um, Carolee from, I think, Canada and Delma here as well. Did did either you, of you or any of the other um, people from outside Australia want to either comment on some differences in the conversations that you've noticed or any general insights from across the ocean? I came in late, uh, so I didn't actually <laughs> get the part of it. So uh, I, I can't really comment unless I have a better idea about what I'm commenting on. Um, so if you want to at least 
California slash U.S. Uh, re response to give a more targeted question, I can certainly address that. Well, something that was mentioned earlier, I suppose, was the major funders like Hewlett Packard, uh, government grants, that sort of thing. Are you aware of how those things came about, whether there were lobbying efforts that were crucial to the these kind of you know higher institutional level supports coming into play? Um, I know a lot <laughs> about this, uh, um, maybe too much. So uh, what, um, uh, what, what would you like to get from that question? <laughs> and then I can answer it. I'm sorry to get targeted here, but there's a, a funding of OER is uh, very uh, complicated, um, uh, and it's oftentimes uh, you know you get you get it from a wide variety of different sources. Are you talking within the context <laughs> of of uh, equity based uh, adaption of OER? Are you talking about OER in general? Again, I'm sorry to probably yeah. in general or the areas where you have the most knowledge and experience and can speak to? Uh, well, I have activities in, in like half the states in, in, in the country um, via the Libra text. And then I have my own personal experience as a chemistry professor at University of California, Davis. Uh, the you guys mentioned the Hewlett Foundation. The Hewlett Foundation uh, uh, is not really a, a good sort. Depending upon if, you're, if you have a if you have a biggish project that you want to go go for, that is not necessarily focused around a specific technology because they've migrated into they've readjusted their priorities a bit recently into more implementation like approaches. Then that is viable. Um, but if you're trying to go in there in order to build a small project or things like that, I mean, you could try, but uh, I wouldn't, I would hold my breath. Uh, it, I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned that the state of California invested $115 million into what they refer to as ZTC uh, for the California Community College System. That is great, obviously, for the California Community College faculty. Uh, it gets more complicated because it's, people are debating exactly what ZTC is because it's not OER. Uh, uh, and there's very little, uh, it's, it's not a top-down uh, financial infrastructure. So each campus is trying to establish their infrastructure. And that is leading, I think, into a lot of chaos. Uh, and invariably, a lot of money is going to disappear <laughs> in that sort of approach. Uh, I'm on a task force from the University of California system in order to expand that. Uh, and the California State University system, so California has 150 campuses. They have the Affordable Learning Solution, which is a uh, has a little bit of money at the top uh, level, but not much. Uh, much of the efforts are more grassroots uh, related. Um, you get support from um, from your campus or I think most people would, would recognize if you're able to get some sort of uh, recognition and merits or promotions uh, that can go a long way in order to be able to make it a I don't want to call it necessarily pro bono but to be able to do stuff without acquiring financial buy-in in order to do that. Uh, other states have other infrastructures. The U.S. Department of Education has this, uh, uh, for the last four years, um, this uh, open textbook pilot. Um, so this is at the federal level, uh, so across all the states. Um, Libre Text got, um, got all the, the, the money in the first round for lots of random reasons. Um, but if you have a project that's about, that's biggish, like 500 thousand to to a million dollars um they uh, that's a good source in order to be able to go through um and they're getting things streamlined and building the package up in order to be able to do it. i think they get roughly five million dollars a year uh in order to be able to do that give or take various issues associated with those sort of things i'm not sure that's addressed your questions i'm kind of throwing things out there instead of giving you a targeted approach off the here uh, the, because because money comes from various stakeholders at various levels, you just basically have to start begging and going in order to be able to uh, to do that, um, and and such. Uh, the 
And the, the take home that I give for the Libra text is that we are funded by the US Department of Education and the California Education Learning Lab. And so we have a mandate in order to be able to support that stuff, that sort of activities just generically across the board. Um, I, as long as you you know build within our infrastructure so we can actually distribute it accordingly, much of that stuff we're actually willing to help out with and provide guidance in terms of being able to do that, especially when it comes to introducing what I consider non-financial benefits associated with OER, because I'm actually very much interested in, in those things. I'm interested in everything, but that thing I, I'm particularly interested in these days. And we have a global infra infrastructure. Uh, we're trying to build a global infrastructure. So uh, I'm also quite interested in using OER in order to handle disadvantaged uh, student populations. Um, for example, we have a new Ukrainian library dedicated for Ukrainian displaced students. Um, uh, which we're very happy in order to do uh, and such. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I took up more of your time. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, I don't want to be the stereotypical American here in order to jump in. I think those were some interesting insights into the, I guess, the idea that funding is not just one thing and that it's it's quite complicated, comes from different sources and comes with different conditions attached and that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing that I found interesting from what you said was that zero textbook costs is not the same as OER. I think in our heads, sometimes those two things get diluted into the same thing and maybe they're not because uh, you can provide library purchase subscriptions, which are free to students, but that's not open access. It's not open education, and it's not um, it's not free for the institution or the library. So that's an important distinction for all of us to keep in mind. I think yeah. more important, it's not sustainable. Uh, that's the key the key component. So it, it will handle the initial issues that you come in, but once the money is gone, those publishers are going to still want their money. Um, so if you want sustainability, you need to have control. You need to have OER. Yeah, I think it's part of that baby step approach, you know, you're stepping people towards open. And the other aspect of like, uh, of not getting things confused is OER isn't always just a textbook. O OER is open educational resources. So any resource that is open and educational is an OER. So you might have an H5P interactive resource, you might have a video, you might have a sound clip. Um, in California, um, at the conference earlier this year, the Cal OER conference, um, uh, one group talked about turning um, an OpenStax book, I think it was American History, um, into an audio version and putting it on Spotify. So that's an that's an OER. It's an audio version of an OER, um, and they're using Spotify, which I just think is so cool. So there's many ways you can approach OER. I see that there is curiosity in the chat about uh, the empowered OER and what's coming. Is, is there, because Adriana has asked, do you have a demo um, that they would love to see what you have so far? Is, is there anything that you can show us or is it yeah. under wraps for now? <laughs> yeah, I can show you the, um, the homepage. <laughs> it's the only one yeah, that sure, has actual content on it. Um, all right, let me just redo my share. It is a little smushed on my laptop screen, so just bear with me for that. So this is the site. Um, I tried to go with just a visual that is, you know, not too confronting and it's just easy on the eyes. Um, I created the logo. I'm very proud of it. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's uh, it'll be kind of, it's a WordPress form. So it'll have a uh, blog post type um, 
pieces of information and there'll be um, pages. So at the top, I've got contribute where people can um, get in touch to add their own resources into this or resources that they think are going to be really helpful. Um, we scroll further down, you can learn a bit more about the actual project. So that'll take you to an about page. Um, and this is where you'll be able to subscribe so you um, can stay up to date on what's going on. We just got a little attribution. You can see it's CC by. So you'll be able to pick the site apart, use as much as you want um, to create your own things. Yeah, this is the site so far. Oh, yeah, thanks, Tim. See that people are quite <laughs> excited to see it. And Delmar's um, wondering, what does it do? Yeah, so um, <laughs> that's okay, Delmar. Um, so it's uh, the purpose of the site is to curate um, a set of resources for Australian librarians to use when um, helping or facilitating the creation of OER that is inclusive. Um, so it's going to be, it'll be incorporating my learnings from the US and Canada as well as um, my learnings here in Australia as well. Yeah, best practices of sorts, yeah. Not as a repo, what do you mean? Oh yeah, not a repository of, it's not like a, it's not like a uh, open textbook library or anything like that. It's more as the the resources for people to use to create the texts. Um, and it's not going to be all of them. It's just going to be a selection of them. Yes, yeah, good point. The open textbook library is a reference to another repository. Yeah. It is a good point though, Delmar, and it's probably something that we lack in Australia, a, a centralised place where people can find Australian themed or based OER. Uh, I guess a lot of our content is in various places like Open Textbook Library, some on Figshare, some on all kinds of places. So. Um, yeah, that's probably something that we need in the in the future. Adriana did ask also, is there a key resource that you came across that you think is worth sharing? I mean, is that kind of what your website um, is designed to answer or is there a particular one you wanted to highlight? Yeah, the website is designed to to help with that. So when you want to look at different areas of um, idea, you can look at different parts of the site for the kind of key resource on that area. There isn't really one that addresses everything because it's such a broad growing field. Um, I would out of the like the, the list that I gave earlier in the talk would be where I would start. But um, particularly that um, branch ed uh, equity rubric is a really, really good one. Um, so I'd, I'd definitely check that one out. Um, I don't know if anyone's put the link in the chat so I can grab the link. I'll also, when we put up the recording of, the, of this webinar, I'll put the slides up and I'll put up a list of links for all of the things that I talked about too, if that's helpful. Uh, Frank or Adrian, did one or both of you want to expand on um, what Call's doing in terms of uh, either hosting or making available Australian OER? I can, Stephen. The, um, I'm yeah, part cool. of the OER Call Collective and um, we come up with the publishing workflow, but there's all been a series of grants that have been uh, issued I think three to six months ago, perhaps, and people are working on uh, producing OER textbooks currently, and they will all be hosted on the uh, OER Collective platform, which Call um, has carriage over. And so all of those resources that are being produced nationally will be represented there. But currently, I think they're all in production. 
and I'm trying to find the, the URL so I can put it into the chat, so I'll do that too. <laughs> Frank, do you know whether it'll be a Pressbooks-based uh, site or is it um, broader than that? It's Pressbooks. It's Pressbooks. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, and, and authors are working um, collaboratively across Australia and New Zealand on, on works uh, that they received grants for. Thanks, Frank. Adrian, was that what you were um, referring to, or are you talking about a different thing? I was also talking about the uh, OER Commons, uh, which is a repository. And um, I know that recently some of the material, for example, from the OER Advocacy Toolkit and from some of the PD sessions that have been run by call, uh, they've actually created a community uh, within the OER Commons and they've been asking people to upload their content uh, so that it's part of that community of resources. Uh, so it might be a, a good idea that rather than creating brand new repositories, if um, anyone is getting into this space, perhaps look at where people go already. And somewhere like the OER Commons where you can tag your content um, with things like uh, you could tag it with Australia, you can tag it with your uh, institution, for example, um, and all of these tags are searchable. Uh, you can even create a community in there for your own content. Yeah, I super Those. encourage everyone to tag with Australia if it's Australian, because they're always having trouble to f find Australian content in the sea of um, everything else. So. Well, thanks everyone for your contributions to the discussion. It's uh, five minutes to the hour now, so we might wrap up the discussion. Um, Ash, before we finish, was there any uh, last words that you wanted to add? Um, I guess just thank you everyone for coming and please do um, continue the good work. You know, let's keep sharing with each other. Thanks. Well, can everyone thank Ash and uh, put your hands together or, or whatever whatever form that takes on Zoom? Um, that's been really fantastic to hear the lessons from overseas. And um, yeah, so thanks for speaking and, and sharing with us, Ash. And uh, we do these webinars every month. So it's great to do one for Open Access Week this month, but uh, we'll be doing more and so make sure that you uh, connect with us at the special interest group WordPress, the URLs are on the slide here, because we, we can email you updates on new posts, new webinars and new monthly digests. And those digests are particularly useful for discovering uh, new OER that have just been published and particularly Australian ones that have just been published. So thank you everyone for coming today and uh, see you next time.